Okay, it's four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Staying safe and staying good, I hope. Heard from some students in, uh, in, my, in my other class that last week was, uh, uh, was a tough week, so you know, hopefully everyone's doing okay. iPad turned off. All right, sounds like people are doing well, which is good. Okay, um, okay. so the, yeah, yeah, three weeks left. It's definitely, you know, def we're definitely in the home stretch right now, that's for sure. Okay, uh, so the plan for today is uh, we're just going to go over uh, heat transfer simulations in ANSYS. Uh, so, you know, we, we've done heat transfer, you know, when we're doing our analytical methods, but we haven't seen how they do it in ANSYS. Um, so I know a few of you guys are doing heat transfer for your final project. So I, I thought, you know, I, I at least want to spend one day just to at least show you where all the buttons are. Um, but uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be anything super in depth, like what we've been doing with structures, but I at least want to show you, you know, where you put the boundary conditions and what they all mean. Okay. Um, so that's the plan for today. Um, so just an announcement before we begin that uh, this Thursday, uh, the project, um, the project uh, progress report is due. Right. So I, I've created an assignment for it on titanium already. So, uh, so again, with the progress report, you know, I, I'm not looking for you to complete, um, you know, I'm not looking for any specific milestones for your project because, you know, everyone's working on something really different. So everyone's, you know, just kind of naturally just by everyone working on every, on different stuff, everyone's kind of at different places within the project, at least from the ones I've spoken to already. So the progress report is, is more just a chance for you to kind of put down just in writing, just kind of take a step back and say, you know, where am I with this project right now and, and what and you know what what do I need to do um, or what challenges am I having right now you know that I could use some help on so um, so I, I'm, I'm less interested in you know what you've accomplished and I'm more interested in you know what are you what's um, you know holding you guys up right now or what issues are you having so that I can give you some help and some advice with that okay because um, all of you guys are doing something really cool for your projects and you know what what I want, you know, in the end is for, you know, everyone to accomplish their goals for their projects. So I think it's, you know, everyone is working on something cool that they can, you know, that they can hopefully present to employers or to keep, you know, just in their portfolio as something that they can be proud of from this class. So, you know, I want everyone su to succeed. And, um, you know, part of that is, you know, you have to get over a lot of the problems because, you know, it's, I'd be, I'd be shocked if, if, you know, as if, uh, you know, everyone completed a project kind of without running into at least one issue. So, you know, tell me about what issues you're having and I'll, I'll see what I can do to help you out. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so are there any questions about that or just any questions about the class in general before we get, uh, we get started today? Okay, so there's no questions. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, um, so I've, I've, I have the uh, kind of the handout that's posted on this. Oh, so there's a question. So how long does the report have to be? Um, you know, it, it, there's no length requirement. So I mean, uh, I, I'd at least like to see one figure. Um, so, you know, everyone, I think everyone at this point has their CAD. So if you can just kind of just remind me, um, just show me a picture of your CAD model or your geometry just to uh, tell me what your project is. Um, and then from there, you know, just just list out any of the issues that you're having, you know, give me as much detail as you can, just so, uh, you know, I can I can help you out as best I can, but there's, there's no length requirement. So it can be either as long or as short as, as you want it to be. Yeah. As long as you turn something in, that's, uh, that's, that's what I'm going to be looking for, in terms of credit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so if we heat transfer simulations and answers, so I, I have a handout that's posted online. Um, and I almost forgot, but I, I also have an example project that kind of shows you, um, you know, that kind of uh, has the result of kind of the activity at the end. So the way the way this is going to go today is I'm, I'm just going to talk about just heat transfer simulations in general and ANSYS and what boundary conditions you can apply. And then at the end, we're going to work through an example. So uh, if your project doesn't involve heat transfer simulations, um, you know, you, you can tune out if you uh, if you want. You know, it's, uh, you know, I won't be offended. Um, but if, for those of you who are interested, or for those of you who need heat transfer, we're going to use heat transfer for your project, uh, or for those of you who are just kind of interested in, in learning how to do this, then hopefully this, uh, this lecture will, will help you out. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's get started. So, you know, so far when we've been doing ANSYS, we've been mostly just focusing on structures, um, but ANSYS can do a lot more than this. So ANSYS can actually do a lot of different kinds of physics. 
Um, so structures is, is obviously, you know, the one that a lot of people use it for, and it's the one probably it's most known. But, but I think probably the second most known one is probably heat transfer. Right? Um, and actually, you know, if you just just from a um, implementation point of view, from, um, you know, someone, someone who's written finite element codes, heat transfer simulations are actually a lot easier to, to implement than, than structures. Um, the primary reason for that is because the primary variable for heat transfer is temperature. Uh, and temperature is a, is a scalar, so it's only one number. Uh, but for, um, uh, for structural simulations, at least ones that are displacement-based, which are ANSYS, which is what ANSYS is, um, you know, and a displacement is a vector. So you have to do basically solve the problems three times, and that creates a lot of really weird vector situations. So, um, you know, a lot of, um, at least commercial codes, if they have structures, then they most likely have um, heat transfer, just because heat transfer is mathematically kind of an easier problem to do. Okay? Uh, but in terms of using it in ANSYS, you know, our 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 um, our um, kind of how we think of it has to shift, and the and the main place where things are going to shift is is mostly in the boundary conditions, um, or as ANSYS like to call, likes to call it, on loads and constraints. So what's not going to change um, in heat transfer simulations is, um, you know, the geometry and the meshing. So um, the meshing, you you can make kind of a small adjustment, but it's you know for the most part you're going to be you're going to be importing your geometry or creating your geometry, and you're going to be meshing it basically the exact same way. So just to kind of get this out of the way, the the uh, the the kind of the big difference that you'll you'll probably use when you're using heat transfer simulations is um, you can instead of using a quadratic um, um, shape function order, uh, what you can do for heat transfer instead is you can use linear. So that saves you a little bit of cost right there. Okay, so that's pretty nice. And then the other note that I'll, I'll give you is that, um, you know, for structures, you know, when we when we applied mesh refinement or we, we were trying to choose places in our mesh that we wanted to refine, we always did it in the places where our stresses were high. So kind of the thermal equivalent for that is, um, you know, um, um, kind of the thermal equivalent of structural stresses is heat flux or heat or heat um, heat transfer. Uh, so where you want to refine your mesh are places where you expect the heat flux to be high. Okay. So if you if you know there are certain parts of your model where lots of heat or lots of energy are going to pass through that uh, that place, then you want to really refine the mesh right there just to make sure you capture that well. Um, but with that said, you know, heat transfer simulations are, are, you know, mathematically easier. So you don't have to refine as heavily as you did for, for structures, but you still, you know, so you still have to pay attention to it a little bit. Okay. okay. Um, so let's, uh, so let's draw some comparisons then. So let's, let's go back to this idea of, you know, the loads and constraints for heat transfer simulations being different. Um, so let's, let's kind of draw the comparisons between what you would do in structures versus what you would do in, uh, in thermal uh, analysis. Okay. So let's start with constraints. Okay. okay. So when we apply a constraint for uh, structural simulations, the uh, kind of the two that we use the most or the one that we use the most, and one and one that we've been kind of using more recently, is the the fixed constraint or the displacement constraint. Okay, um, so if you go back to kind of when we were talking about the theory, um, you, we know that when we apply a fixed constraint or a displacement constraint, that's essentially a, an essential boundary condition, right?
So the thermal equivalent of, a, of an essential boundary condition, which um, you know, we, we've gone over this before, is a temperature. So uh, you know, when, we, when we go to apply uh, constraints in our model, you know, the, the way that we do that for a thermal simulation is we specify a temperature. Um, so this is probably kind of the easiest uh, or the most kind of simple to understand boundary condition that you can apply where if you know the temperature of your, um, uh, of your geometry at a certain location, then you can just directly specify that through ANSYS. Right? Um, that's essentially the same thing as applying a constraint, a fixed constraint or a displacement constraint, because those are gonna be our essential boundary conditions, basically. All right, any questions on this before I, uh, I turn the page? Okay. Okay, so that's for constraints. And now let's go over loads. Okay. So loads, remember, are uh, basically uh, for for structural simulations. Those are those usually constitute some kind of forcing that we apply. Um, so the ones that we've been using most often are um, just a straight up force condition. Okay. Okay. Um, so we can apply a force kind of directly onto our, our model through, through ANSYS. Okay. Another one that we've used pretty often is a pressure. Um, and some other ones that, that um, you know, you might find interesting for your project that we haven't used in activities or you can apply torques. Um, torques are, are, are bending moments. Um, you, can, you can definitely do that. Okay? Uh, but the thermal equivalent of, the, of these are, uh, are all, uh, you know, kind of harken back to uh, either whether you're taking it now or you've taken it in the past to your 407 class. Okay? So some thermal loads that we can apply, uh, kind of the first one that we can do is a heat flux. Or heat flow, so I think sometimes it's called an ANSYS. Okay. Uh, where you define the, basically the amount of energy that's passing through a surface um, through a given second. Okay. Uh, so another, another type of boundary uh, thermal load that you can do is convection. So in ANSYS, you can specify certain surfaces in your model to be either cooled or heated by, um, by convection. So uh, if you remember, convection is the, the process of either heating or cooling through the act of a moving fluid. So if you have air or you have water that's kind of moving past your surface, it's kind of blowing over the top just like this, um, then convection is going to occur. Um, so convection is, is you know, a, another mode of heat transfer where kind of there's kind of a bulk movement of fluid that kind of helps the heat transfer along. Okay? And then the last one that we'll go over today, um, at least among kind of the basic thermal loads, is radiation. Okay. Um, so I think maybe right about now, or maybe starting next week, the 407 classes are probably getting to radiation. So uh, radiation is a special kind of heat transfer that um, basically occurs through electromagnetic waves. Um, so unlike conduction and convection, it doesn't require a, a medium. Okay. Um, so for a lot of cases, radiation is actually pretty negligible um, for at least a lot of the cases um, on Earth. Um, but there's um, you know, if you don't have any uh, heat transfer medium, then radiation becomes really important. So kind of the one that really comes to mind for this is if you have kind of any applications in space. Because uh, in space, you know, there's kind of just, there's no air, there's no, uh, you know, medium out there to, to transfer heat. So the only way that, um, you know, heat transfers, um, at, least, at least to kind of the, um, to, you know, the deep, deep space is through radiation. Okay. okay. So that's all the, uh, um, you know, the constraints and the loads. So we'll go over basically each one and, and how we, we apply that in ANSYS. Okay. Before we do that, let me just, um, just quickly write out the, uh, the equation that we want to solve, okay. just so you can have, have an idea. So underneath the hood, ANSYS is, is you know, when you say that you want to do a, a, a static thermal simulation, then what ANSYS is basically solving is the heat equation.
Okay, so the heat equation is given by this. So it's a partial differential equation. So we have d squared t dx squared plus d squared t dy squared plus d squared t dz squared plus q dot is equal to f. Okay. So let's label these terms. So we have t here. t is our, our primary variable. So t is going to be our temperature. Okay. Right. So q dot, um, this is a special function called the volumetric thermal generation. Um, so if your um, if your geometry itself is kind of generating heat, usually this occurs through some chemical reaction or some um, some electric heating. Um, then you can account for that kind of directly in the uh, in the heat equation. Okay. And then finally, our function f uh, represents any kind of kind of external thermal loads. So any kind of external heating or external cooling that's applying, uh, that's being applied to your system. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is just kind of for uh, your, for your trivia. Um, so this is kind of the equation that's being solved underneath the hood, but since ANSYS is solving it, then, you know, we don't have to worry about it. All we have to worry about is basically setting up the mesh and setting up the boundary conditions um, so that ANSYS can solve your problem correctly. Okay. All right. Any questions on this before we, uh, I turn the page? Okay. Okay, so let's go over each of the different um, loads and, or thermal loads and thermal constraints that you can apply, kind of just one by one um, in, in more detail. And then uh, at the end, you know, we'll do an example that kind of puts all this together. Okay. So first, let's do uh, temperature boundary conditions. Uh, so like we said before, this is basically the equivalent of a uh, displacement constraint. So in terms of the application in ANSYS, it's, it's, it's you know, relatively simple to do. Okay. So let's say that we have a geometry. So let's say that we have a kind of a cylinder like this. Okay. Um, so we brought this into ANSYS, so we've opened this in mechanical. Um, you know, say that we've already meshed it, and now we're basically ready to apply uh, boundary conditions. Okay. And so say that you know, we want to apply a temperature boundary condition on this, on this space right here. Okay. So basically what we're saying is that this, the temperature of this space We'll call it TF. We'll say it's close to, uh, um, um, you know, to, uh, to ambient conditions. So let's say it's uh, 25 degrees C. Okay. And so what you do is that you, uh, you go into ANSYS and you click, you know, the proper select mode. So in this case, since we're uh, applying the temperature boundary condition on a surface, um, you know, you make sure that you're on face select mode. And then you'll um, go into ANSYS thermal. You uh, insert a boundary condition. So in this case, you're going to insert temperature. Uh, and then you just simply set that temperature to 25 degrees. So basically kind of exactly the same process that you, um, that you follow for displacement. Okay. So really straightforward, really, really easy. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is, this is something that we'll go over um, kind of in the example at the end. So just, just so you can know where to look for it in the, uh, um, in the, um, in the, uh, in the GUI. Okay. Any, qu any questions on this before I turn the page? Okay. 
Uh, so now let's go over uh, heat flow and heat flux boundary conditions. So I think you can do both in ANSYS, but they kind of mean this, the same thing, basically. Okay. So remember, this is basically analogous to our, uh, basically analogous to either force or pressure um, load that you would apply um, in structures. Okay. And so what this um, does is that it, um, you know, specifies the total amount of heat going through usually a, a surface. Um, so this is, um, you know, kind of easy, easy to kind of grasp in concept, but it's, it's a little bit difficult to kind of, um, you know, I, I would say kind of come up with the numbers with in practice, right? Because heat flux or, or heat flow is, is something a lot less physical than something like a force, right? So a force or a pressure, you, you can measure it pretty easily. Um, but for the amount of you know, heat or the amount of energy that passes through a surface, that's a little bit harder to kind of um, at least kind of visualize and see. Okay? Um, so, um, you know, before we, before we get into how you apply this in ANSYS, I, I kind of want to just give you kind of maybe some examples that um, that you might be able to use for your uh, for your project if you want to apply this or if this kind of boundary condition would be appropriate kind of based on you know the some of the some of the heat transfer simulations that people did for their projects last year and kind of just based on kind of what I've observed okay um, so even though it's it's hard to determine how much um, you know energy kind of passes through a surface kind of without some kind of hand calculations to back it up if you know, um, you know something about either some chemical reaction that's going on or how much power is being output by a device, you can use that information to, to kind of apply heat flux boundary condition. Okay. So as an example, let's consider a, uh, say that you're running a, an ANSA simulation of a combustion chamber. Oh, question. Let's see. Great. Um, so, you know, and you and you, what you want when what you're interested in for this combustion chamber is you want to see, you know, you want to simulate how the temperature is going to be distributed throughout the the chamber after a combustion reaction has taken place, or back, basically after you've ignited your your fuel inside. Okay. Um, so, because you know, chemical reactions are always really complicated. You know, they're they're really hard to to, uh, um, you know. Uh, to track, um, you know, it's, it's, it'd be really difficult for us to kind of use something like a temperature boundary condition because we don't know what temperature the thing is going to explode at, um, especially, you know, in a, within a spatial case. Um, so, you know, for this case where you're trying to simulate like a combustion reaction, specifying a temperature is, it would be really difficult just because, you know, you don't really know what temperature the thing is going to, um, to set. Okay? Um, but one thing that you, that you can probably calculate is, you know, kind of based on the amount of fuel that, that's going in and based on the amount of, you know, oxygen and based on kind of, you know, what you know about kind of the kinetics of the, uh, of the reaction, what you can compute is basically how much energy that the, uh, um, that the reaction is going to give off. Okay. 
And so, you know, usually energy is given by, you know, it's given to you in, in some uh, units like joules, okay? And so what you can do is that you can, uh, you can take that amount of energy, you can divide it by the amount of time that the reaction takes, okay? Okay. And so when you, um, um, you divide joules by time, you get a, um, the unit of power. And as we all know, watt is the unit of power, right? It's not a question, it's the answer to the, the question, okay? And so watts is actually the, the, the units for heat flow. Okay? So if you want to kind of take this a step further and you want to apply this heat flux, you can take that, um, you know, those, that wattage and divide it by the surface area of your, of your chamber. Okay? Okay. And then you'll get kind of the output of your combustion reaction as a, uh, you know, as a heat flux, which is watts per meter square. And so now that you have this heat flux right here, okay, what you can do is you can directly apply that as a heat flux boundary condition in ANSYS. And then from there, you, you, can, you can simulate basically how the temperature is going to be distributed without knowing you know, what temperature your combustion reaction is going to, to take place. Okay? Um, so kind of a spin off this, uh, um, a spin off this example is I, I remember one, one person last year was uh, basically he had kind of a small kind of electric engine that's kind of going that went along with his uh, his uh, senior design project, and he wanted to see he wanted to run a thermal analysis on it. And so what he knew about his uh, his electric engine is that he didn't you know um, he wasn't sure what temperature it, it was going to be on the surface of that engine. But what he did know was basically how much energy was was coming off that engine in terms of heat, um, just by just just by doing a, ther a thermodynamics analysis of that, just by kind of comparing you know how much energy is going into the uh, into the machine how much of it is being converted into mechanical work and then just taking the difference between that and that's that's how much the engine is kind of giving off heat um, and then once he's computed that then he applied that as basically a, a heat flux boundary condition on system um, and from there he was able to run his simulation uh, pretty accurately okay. all right any questions on on this Um, so if you're if you're planning on doing a thermal simulation um, on some kind of part for your for your final project, um, you know try to think of it in terms of, of the amount of heat energy that the uh, that your part is going to produce. Okay? Um, so if you need to run kind of a thermodynamics analysis on either your engine or you know whatever part that you're doing, just to see how much energy is being lost due to heat, um, that would be something good. That would be a great calculation to do because that that's going to motivate how you're going to uh, to supply the loads to your uh, to your geometry. Okay, um, so that's heat flux. Um, so there's actually a, a kind of a very special case of a heat flux boundary condition that you that you probably use in 407 quite a bit, um, and that's called the uh, a perfectly insulated uh, boundary condition. Okay. Oops. So perfectly insulated, it's a, uh, it's, it's basically the same thing as a heat flux boundary condition, um, but it's a special type where um, you basically say heat flux is going to be zero. Okay. But it's used kind of so often um, in, a, in ANSYS and actually, you know, um, just from a, uh, um, you know, just from a, you know, looking at it from a kind of a, um, you know, overall standpoint, knowing which surfaces are perfectly insulated is something that's, that's important. That ANSYS actually created a special boundary condition type for, for this. Okay? Um, so it's, it's a little bit redundant because, uh, um, you know, you can, you, can you can definitely just apply a heat flux boundary condition to these surfaces that you want insulated um, and just set it to zero. So that's basically the same thing. Um, but because it's used so often, you know, ANSYS basically created a, a new button for it. Um, so that's basically kind of the same, the same reason why they created a, a button for a fixed constraint. Because uh, a fixed constraint is nothing more than just a displacement constraint, but you set all the displacements to zero. 
Um, so for per perfectly insulated, it's the same thing. Um, so, you know, perfectly insulated, you know, it, it's, in reality, it's, it's really hard to get a surface that's perfectly, perfectly insulated because it, it's really hard um, to basically make it so that a, a surface or any part of any surface gives off no heat at all. Okay. Um, so if anything, perfect, perfect insulation is more of a um, kind of a, a handy kind of um, um, approximation. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure you've used it in your 407 class quite a bit. Okay. Um, but in, so in ANSYS, you know, it, it's basically going to be the same thing. So based on any surface where you don't want any heat passing through it, you can just set it to have a, a perfectly insulated fabrication. Okay. Uh, so some, one example for this is if you if you've insulated a surface, you know, and, and you know on the outside that's going to be styrofoam. Um, so styrofoam is one of the very kind of famous um, non-insulating materials. That's why they make um, you know um, you know disposable coffee cups out of it, so that you don't burn your hands on coffee. Um, so if you know that you know you're going to have styrofoam on the outside, then you know one way that you can model that in ANSYS is just say that the heat flux is going to be zero here. So then you would apply a, a perfectly insulated boundary condition there. Okay. okay. Um, so that's insulation. So like now let's go over convection. Um, so again, convection is a heat transfer to some moving fluid, right? Okay. So what occurs basically when you have a, uh, a surface and then over the surface, you have some kind of fluid that's blowing over it. Okay. Okay. So oftentimes you need, uh, you need two parameters um, associated with convection. So you need T infinity, where this T infinity here, this is the ambient temperature. Okay. And then this H, um, where, where this H is called the convection coefficient. Right. So you, you, you can use a, a convection boundary condition. Um, so, so some common situations for this is if you have a surface that's being either cooled by air or for water. Right? So this is pretty common for, uh, for electronics in your computer um, where you have a fan that's kind of blowing over it. So anything that's going to be either air cooled or water cooled, um, you know, you would use convection boundary condition. So another, another example would be inside your engine uh, where you have kind of heat transfer that occurs to the uh, kind of to the oils. Um, in your engine pretty often. So that's kind of another case where that oil is kind of constantly flowing. Okay. And then once you know T infinity, your ambient temperature, ambient temperature is usually pretty easy to determine, um, and you know your convection coefficient, um, then you can compute the heat transfer based on Newton's law of cooling, which I'll put on the next page. Okay. Um, before I do that, are, are any questions on, on this page here? So Newton's law of cooling is, is given by, by this. Okay. okay, so it basically says that the heat transfer Q is gonna be equal to H A times T of the surface minus T infinity, so the tamping temperature. 
So hopefully that, that looks familiar from your 407 class. Okay. okay. Um, so like we, like we uh, said, this ambient temperature is usually pretty easy to determine because uh, so say, you know, you're having your computer um, that's being cooled by air. T infinity would just be the temperature of the room, which is, you know, often, um, you know, 25 degrees. What's difficult to get in this uh, in this equation is this H. Okay. Because okay. if you remember from 407, um, basically this H coefficient is going to depend on uh, so many different things. It's going to depend on the geometry. It's going to de depend on the type of fluid. It's going to depend on whether your flow is laminar or turbulent. Um, so this thing's usually really hard to uh, to determine. All right, so question, in ANSYS, would we apply the convection and flux from the oil to the engine directly to the surface? Um, so it depends on what you're modeling. So for most cases, you're gonna be, mod you're gonna be uh, doing a simulation on just the solid um, part. Uh, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't simulate kind of the fluid going over it. So um, we'll, see, we'll see this in the example where basically you would select a, a certain surface in your model. Um, and then you would say that there's, I'm gonna apply a convection boundary condition here. Okay? And then the only parameters that you have to specify are T infinity, which is the temperature of the uh, of the ambient fluid, okay? And then you have to specify H as well. Um, so if you uh, if you know H, um, and that's a big if I, I know, um, then you would uh, basically just directly specify it as a convection boundary condition with the, with an ANSYS. Okay. Um, so then, how do you find H? Oh, question. All right. Uh, so how do you find H? Um, so that's a great question. So uh, you know. I, I'm not going to, uh, you know, spend probably, I think last time I taught 407, it took maybe uh, two weeks for, for us to go over methods to, uh, to find H. Um, so we're not going to do that here. Um, so, you know, to find your H, I'm basically just going to tell you, good luck. Okay. I'll give you a smiley face too, right? Um, because it's uh, it's hard. It's 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 really hard to find H because it, it because it depends on on so many uh, issues. Um, so what I would recommend and, and kind of what I what I told people last year was um, to um, try to kind of simplify your geometry because I mean the, the biggest thing that's standing in our way um, for ANSYS simulations that are, our, our geometries are often really complex. So it, it doesn't really fall into any of the cases where um, you could compute it based on you know what you learned from 407. Um, so what I what I've been what I told people last year was just to kind of try maybe try to simplify your geometry as as best you can, um, and then try to apply it to something that's relatively close um, to something that you can apply in 407. Um, you know, knowing um, things and, and you can compute things like the Reynolds number and, and things like that, just kind of based off um, you know some approximations. Um, so that's one way that you can do it. Um, another way that you can do it is that um, for for some situations, people have tabulated this. So they've run experiments um, and they've basically published papers where they computed this H. Um, so if you wanna do a bit of research and, and to try to see if someone's run an experiment on a geometry that's relatively similar to yours, um, you know, in kind of a, a relatively similar flow situation, um, you can definitely use those H values. Um, so that's kind of another avenue that you can, you can do. Okay? Um, but, you know, end of the day, I, I know that, you know, if you are applying convection boundary condition, whatever you apply for H is, is gonna be an approximation. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna you know, look and see that you, you computed this really accurately or, or really well, but as long as it's reasonable and you have some kind of evidence or some kind of calculations to back it up, I think that's, that's, you know, that's kind of the best that you can do in this situation. That's, and that's kind of the most that I would expect. Okay. okay. Uh, so any questions on uh, convection? Okay, so the last one that we uh, we can do in ANSYS is radiation. And so like we said before, radiation is a kind of a special kind of heat transfer that occurs through electromagnetic waves.
okay? Uh, and, and because it, uh, it's heat transferred through waves, you don't actually need a medium, okay? Um, so there's no, um, there's no such thing as like a, uh, like a thermal, there's no kind of material constant that's associated with radiation. So before you would have things like the thermal conductivity um, or, the, uh, uh, or the H, which we talked about before. Um, so in radiation, there, there's none of that, okay? So in radiation, the, the formula that we use is given by this, okay? So we say Q is equal to um, epsilon times sigma times TS to the fourth minus T infinity to the fourth. Um, and I know this is a, a very simple implied version of, of radiation, but you know, radiation is something where the rabbit hole goes really, really deep. So I, I'd rather not get into it too much, but I think this is, this is kind of good enough, at least for uh, learning how to uh, apply these kind of boundary conditions and answers. Okay. Um, so the one parameter that you, or the parameters that you have to know are these ones. So E right, or this epsilon right here, this is the emissivity of your surface, okay? So that's gonna be a property of the, uh, of whatever surface that you have. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, something that you often have to look up, but it's usually easier to determine than the convection coefficient. Okay? And then this T infinity has the same um, uh, uh, definition up there, and this is the ambient temperature. Uh, and so just like in convection, this TS is the, uh, the surface temperature. Okay. And then the sigma right here, this is what's called the, the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Okay. So you don't, know, you don't need to know its value or uh, you know, what it is or what the units are because ANSYS basically computes that for you. So, um, so if you haven't gone over this in 4.7, I, I imagine you're going to go over it pretty, pretty soon. Okay, so let's talk about emissivity because that's kind of the main um, thing that you have to specify. Okay. okay. So emissivity, it's a, uh, it's a, it's, it's basically a, a number. Um, it's between zero and one. Okay. And you can think of it as like a scale. Um, so if your emissivity is basically zero, then it um, then that's basically saying that you have no radiation. Okay. Um, and then the kind of the opposite end of that spectrum is 1.0, and um, where the body or your uh, um, or your geometry is going to accept basically all the radiation. And so actually the emissivity equal to one is a, a special case, which is known as a black body. So black bodies are, are often very difficult to find in, in, uh, in practice, um, if not impossible, um, but it's kind of, a, uh, kind of a nice convenient thing for, a, uh, for calculation, okay? Because what can happen with radiation sometimes is that the electromagnetic waves, they can either um, reflect off your surface. So just like, you know, light can reflect off the surface. Um, either that or they can pass through. So basically any kind of radiation waves that either reflect off your surface or pass through it uh, won't be absorbed by the surface and no heat transfer will occur. Okay? Um, so basically this emissivity um, basically is, is, uh, is, is kind of a way to kind of capture that. So the emissivity, one way that you can think of it is that is the percentage of radiation waves that hit your surface that are actually absorbed and actually contribute to some kind of thermal, uh, thermal change in, in the body. Okay, um, so um, basically the emissivity is, is something that you can look up um, for your model. And it's gonna depend on the material um, or, um, and less so on the geometry. Okay. okay. And that should be relatively easier to, uh, um, to determine. Okay. Any questions on, on radiation? We're basically covering, for, for covering uh, 407 in a nutshell today. <laughs>
<laughs> Chris or Trent? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so far objects in space, so then would all uh, like transfer of, of heat be in the form of like radiation only because there's no, there's nothing for, there's no like uh, medium? Yep. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So in space, um, you know, that, that's kind of the place where radiation is mostly um, relevant. Um, because there's no medium out there, you can't have any conduction or convection that occurs. Uh, so the only way for, um, like, you know, for a lot of times this, this is, you know, you, you do radiation analysis for satellites. So the only way for a lot of satellites to get energy is for them to get radiation from the sun, basically. So, you know, a lot of, you know, satellite design is kind of designing um, the solar panels and divine, designing its orbit such that it's kind of, you know, it's going to, um, the panels are basically going to hit the sun kind of as, as most as it can, because that's the only way that it's, it's, that's one of the only ways it's going to get energy, especially if, you know, there's only so much fuel that you, you can put on the satellite uh, to begin with anyway, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, oh. Uh, and then another question I had is, mm -hmm. so then, so then that craft would also, or object would also have to like release that energy somehow if it had like a temperature limit or something. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, uh, yeah, that's a great observation too. So, you know, just like, you know, you have to absorb energy from the sun, um, but yeah, there, there has to be a way to, there has to be some kind of heat sink on your satellite to basically boot out some, some kind of excess heat, um, you know, just so that your parts don't melt. Um, but, you know, a good thermal design will try to make as, as much use of that heat as, as possible for energy because, you know, it's really hard to get, um, you know, energy up there. Um, so, you know, it's, there's some, there's some aspect of, uh, of, you know, heat sinks that have to occur, but, you know, you try to avoid it and you try to use that kind of as much as you can for, to either run the electronics or, or to do other stuff, uh, just to make as, as most efficient use of it as possible. Okay. Okay. So before we jump into the example, I, I just want to, uh, just kind of briefly talk about some of the outputs that you can do. And so by outputs, I mean things like the, uh, the color contour plots that you produce after running your ANSYS simulation. Uh, so for structures, we, uh, we looked at outputs like, um, like total deformation and the stress field. Okay? Um, so for thermal, um, probably the one that you're going to be most interested in is the, the temperature. Um, so the temperature um, basically will tell you how the temperature is distributed. So it'll it'll literally show you a, a heat map um, of your uh, um, of your part, um, which is really nice. Okay. And so the other one that you might be interested in is um, oops, uh, heat flux. Um, so you can use ANSYS to basically tell you what parts of your model are basically um, have the most heat that's that's coming off the the model okay, uh, at any given time. Okay, and so with that, uh, let's do an example simulation. Okay. So I've uploaded this to, uh, um, um, to Titanium. Um, so you can um, download that, and I, I've basically set up everything for you. Uh, but just to kind of just to give you a sense of, um, you know, what the situation is, let me just draw the geometry here. All right, so the example that I have posted is a, uh, basically a cylindrical fin. Um, so on the left side of this fin, um, you know, we're going to, this is um, basically where it's going to attach to some electronic device. And let's, let's say that we know that the temperature, okay. so we can say that the temperature of the base is going to be, you know, say it's a really hot computer. So, so let's say it's hundred degrees C. And then let's say that we, we, that we've set the fin to be sufficiently long that on the right side here, we have an insulated boundary condition. So we're going to apply basically a perfectly insulated case there. The diameter of the uh, of the fin is five centimeters, and then the length um, is a hundred centimeters. So it's a ginormous fin. Okay. So we have some radiation going on. So we have an emissivity of of zero point three.
And let's say that we have convection going on too. So we have a T infinity of 25 degrees C and H is gonna be 0 0.5 watts per meter squared K. Okay. Right. So this is the, uh, the situation that we're going to uh, run our simulation. In. All right, any questions on the on the setup before I, I switch over to to Ansys? Okay, so let me share my other screen. Okay. All right. So here we're in ANSYS. So I basically taken the uh, the project and I've uh, I've removed all of the uh, um, all the stuff. So the one that you download from Titanium will have all the boundary conditions and the outputs there for you. Uh, but I kind of just want to show you where, where all the buttons are. Um, so let's uh, let's kind of just walk through this together. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to start right here. So I'm going to start with our uh, my geometry that I've created. It's just a simple just a cylinder um, that I've uh, created in Design Modeler and I've already meshed it. Okay. Um, so I've, uh, because we have a curved geometry here, I've used tetrahedral mesh. Okay? Um, but, you know, because of this uh, unique geometry, there's, there's another element type that we can actually use that's a lot more efficient. So you can see with this mesh right now, we're running up to uh, 19,574 elements. So it's, uh, you know, pretty bulky. Um, but, you know, kind of taking what we learned from um, ANSYS Activity 5, we know that another way that we can mesh this is we can actually use beam elements, right? Um, so if we use a beam element that kind of goes, you know, that's going from one end to the other, that's going to save us a ton of, um, you know, a ton of cost here. Um, but because I made this last year, um, before I learned about how to do shell and beams, this is kind of what we're going to work with. And it's kind of okay too, just because the, uh, the, the outputs kind of look nicer when it's, uh, when it's like this. Okay, so the first thing to do, let's, uh, let's set our temperature boundary condition on one side of the face um, of the fin, okay? So we're going to set a temperature boundary condition on this face right here. So to set a temperature boundary condition, you want to go to um, steady state thermal right here, okay, A5. So you're going to insert a temperature boundary condition, okay. And so just like we've, uh, we've always done, we're going to select a face, okay. We're going to hit apply, and then we're going to give it the, uh, the magnitude of the temperature, and we know that this temperature is going to be 100 degrees C. Uh, so basically kind of exactly how we did displacements where we select the face, we set the value, and then we're, uh, we're good to go. Okay. Oh, actually, uh, you know, one uh, really important thing that I, I kind of neglected coming in here, um, you know, to actually start a thermal simulation, you know, you have to start from workbench. So you have to start from right here. And, you know, usually we, we, uh, we apply this, um, uh, this analysis tool right here, static structural. But to run a thermal simulation, we, we don't want static structural. What you want instead is steady state thermal, okay? And so what you're gonna do, uh, you know, imagine that this is a, a blank workspace, is that you're gonna click steady state thermal and you're gonna drag it over to the, uh, to the empty space right there, okay? Uh, so for this example, I kind of did that for you so you don't have to do it. But if for, uh, for your projects, if you're doing a thermal simulation, you can do uh, steady, state, steady state thermal right here. And then the, uh, uh, if you wanna do kind of an unsteady thermal simulation, kind of combine uh, this with ANSYS Activity 4, the way that you would do it is you would do transient thermal. Okay? So instead of doing explicit dynamics here, you would do transient thermal kind of right here. And then you can do an unsteady thermal simulation from that. Okay? The setup is mostly the same. It's just that the uh, kind of like what we did with um, ANSYS Activity 4, you would also need to supply some kind of initial condition to your, uh, to your simulation. Okay? Okay, uh, so that's the temperature boundary condition. Uh, so now let's set the condition on the other side. So on the other side, we know that the, uh, the condition is gonna be a perfectly insulated. So let's insert that, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and right click steady state thermal, just like we did before. And then let's set, let's see. Right here, perfectly insulated, okay? Um, so remember, perfectly insulated, um, just like the, the tooltip says right here, it's going to be a face um, where no heat flow is going to occur. Okay. So let's go ahead and click that. And then the only thing that we have to specify here is what surface that we want to apply it for. So then let's apply it on the opposite end. Since we applied a, a temperature boundary condition on that end, let's apply the perfect, the perfect insulation on the other end. So let's go ahead and hit apply. 
So now if we look at our boundary conditions, we have a uh, temperature boundary condition on one side and a perfect insulation on the other. Okay. So that's two out of the uh, um, that's two out of the four. Okay. So the next thing that we need to do is convection. So let's go ahead and right click uh, steady state thermal, go to insert, and then let's set a convection boundary condition. Okay. So convection give the kind of the tooltip for this is kind of a fan that's blowing. So that that kind of reminds you that convection is um, you know heat transfer to some kind of moving fluid. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what the tooltip says right here. So convection heat transfer occurs on one or more flat or curved faces that's in contact with the fluid. Okay. So let's go ahead and click this and create a, a convection boundary condition. And so the, the surface that we're gonna apply this on is gonna be the lateral surface of the fin, okay? Because this is the, uh, the primary surface that's gonna be in contact with the fluid, because we know that the fluid is gonna go basically from, from left to right across the, the surface like this, okay? or it could flow kind of up and down like, like this. But basically it's, it's basically gonna be cooling this large surface area right here. Um, so once we've selected that surface, we hit apply. So then we've selected it. And you can see here that we need to set two, um, uh, two boundary conditions here, okay. or two, uh, two parameters here. So first is the film coefficient. So film coefficient is another um, name for the, uh, for the H value. Okay. And you, know, you wanna be careful here because you wanna make sure that you're in the right units because right now we're in watts per millimeter squared C. Okay. Uh, so just to make things kinda, um, consistent with our problem, so let's change this to uh, meters. So now we're in watts per meter squared C, so that's the uh, correct units. And if we go back to our problem statement, we know that this is gonna be 0 0.5, okay? And then our ambient temperature is gonna be 25 degrees, just like uh, we said. So ambient temperature, that's gonna be the, uh, the T infinity um, in, our, uh, in our equations, okay? Uh, so that's our convection boundary condition, okay? And so next, let's insert the uh, radiation. Um, so to insert radiation, we go to the same place where we, we right click steady state thermal, and then we go to insert. Um, and then from this menu, we select radiation. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and click that. Okay. Um, so just like we did for, um, for convection, we need to select the surface. So let's go ahead and select the lateral surface here and then hit apply. Okay. And notice how we've uh, selected that same surface for both a convection and a radiation boundary condition. Um, so that's totally okay. So you can you can supply uh, more than one thermal load. Um, so basically, what's going to happen is that heat heat is going to leave that surface due to both convection and radiation, um, and that's kind of consistent with what happens in reality too. So if you have a fin like this, then it's going to lose heat um, both due to convection and also radiation. Okay. So we've selected the lateral face. We've hit apply, and then now we just set our our two um, coefficients here. Okay. So the first one we need to set is the emissivity. So the default uh, value for this is one. Um, so basically the default is a, uh, is we default to a black body, um, which is, um, you know, not that realistic. So let's set this to a more realistic value of 0 0.3. Okay. And then for the ambient temperature, let's set it to uh, 25. Okay. okay. So there's a question, let's see. Uh, so the question is, uh, are we modeling incoming radiation as well as outgoing? So this, this kind of handles both. Uh, so basically, if, it's, if the temperature of your, um, of your object is higher than uh, the temperature of the ambient, then that's going to be outgoing radiation because radiation is going to cause heat transfer from the hot surface to the kind of the cooler atmosphere. Um, but if you have a situation where your ambient temperature is higher, so say that you, know, you have this piece and it's inside kind of a, a long oven, right? Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah. So it's it's just one body here. So yeah. It's it's basically just going to be um, um, heat transfer from that one body to the atmosphere, and whether it's incoming or outgoing depends on the difference in the temperature. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's all the loads and constraints. So let me check the PDF just to make sure I got everything. So the PDF that I posted online, the, uh, the interface um, is kind of from the last year's version. So the buttons are not in the same place, um, unfortunately. I don't know why they do that, but they, uh, I, think, I guess they like to update their software. Okay? Um, so if you're, if you're looking on where the buttons are, I would follow kind of the, 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 the method that we're doing here. Okay. And so the last thing that we need to specify is our outputs, because so we, we have basically everything we need to run the simulation, but we need to uh, specify you know, what outputs uh, we're gonna look at. Okay? 
Um, so to specify our output field, so we're going to um, right-click Solution A6 and then go to Thermal. Um, and then let's look at the temperature. So temperature is, you know, something that we always want to look at. Okay. And then the other thing that we, uh, we can look at is the heat flux. So let's select total heat flux. Okay. Question. All right. So the question is, if we were modeling a part that was going to be placed outside, would we do something along the lines of including an external radiation source from the sun? Um, you definitely, you definitely could do that. Um, you can definitely apply radiation to basically all external surfaces. Um, and basically just uh, input the uh, kind of the temperature of the of the outside. Yeah, so that's so that'll basically take care of, you know, if the if their parts can be heated from the sun, if the sun's basically, you know, warmer than, than that. Um, if not, then it's going to be radiation out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, for, for a lot of engineering um, structures, unless it's something that's going to be outside for a really long time, um, the, the heating from the sun is usually fairly negligible. Um, but if it's not, then that, that would be some way that you can, uh, you can do it. So the question is, will we have to worry about the direction of the heat coming from the sun as well? Um, ah, yeah, that's a great question, actually. Yeah, actually, you know, the uh, probably the radiation from the sun you would have to include is probably a different radiation source. Um, so I'll, I'll admit that I, I'm I'm not the biggest expert on on heat transfer. Um, so that would be that would be I think something really interesting to talk about with maybe like Dr. Banks or something. Um, but I think yeah, I think that's definitely an important consideration, especially you know if if your part's going to be partially in the shade and that you know and it's going to be sitting outside for a long time. And that shade is going to, you know, change as the sun moves across the sky as well. So I think that would be, you know, I think that would be something that's important to, uh, to do as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how you would actually implement it in, in ANSYS, I think that's, that's, that's probably, that's, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so we're basically um, done with the setup here. So now we can go ahead and click Solve. So the answer is going to solve. It's the first time I've run answers today, so it has to kind of remember that, you know, my, my computer has to remember that it's not a piece of crap, that it can it can do this. Okay, so our simulation is done, so we can take a look at the results. So let's look at the, uh, the temperature distribution first, okay? Uh, so here we have a, a, a literal heat map, okay? So you can see the temperature is gonna be maximum here on the left-hand side, which is where we supply our temperature boundary condition. So we basically um, require that the temperature here is gonna be 100 degrees C, right? So that's basically what we observe here, so that's good. Okay? And then what you can see here, because of the, the cooling from the radiation and from the convection, the temperature very quickly drops off. So you can see that the majority of this fin um, has a temperature of 25 degrees. So that's the same temperature as the ambient temperature. Okay? Um, so that makes a lot of sense because there's, you know, if the ambient temperature is 25, there's no way for the uh, for this fin to basically have a temperature that's below that. Um, that would be um, kind of insane. Okay? So you can see that, you know, our, our temperature goes from a maximum of 100 at the um, at the base or where we supplied the, the heat transfer. And then as we go along the fin, the, uh, the temperature kind of rapidly drops off. Okay. Um, so if you want to actually, you know, verify this simulation with, uh, with some calculation for 407, um, this is basically a one dimensional fin. Um, so you, you can, uh, you know, take the same numbers here. And if you plot uh, or you get the, your solution for T of X or your temperature distribution, you should see that it looks very similar to this, where you have kind of a very sharp drop off at the beginning and then a period where it's basically flat um, at 25 after that. Okay. Um, so then let's, now let's take a look at our total heat flux. Okay. So our heat flux, the, uh, the map looks the same, it's just the values are different. So you can see here that the majority of the heat transfer happens at the, at the base here. So we have a maximum heat flux of 721.31 uh, watts per meter square. And then as we get along the uh, as we get along the the, uh, the length of the fin, where the fin temperature starts to match the ambient temperature, we basically have no heat transfer at all. Okay, 
And remember, the reason for that is because the temperature of the fin matches that exactly of the atmosphere, it, because you have this kind of um, equilibrium situation where these two temperatures match, there's no way for them to, uh, to exchange heat. So you can see basically, once you get to the blue area here, you have a heat um, flux that's basically zero. So 7.346 times 10 to the minus eight. Um, so it's never going to be completely zero. There's always going to be some kind of small error, but you know, compared to 721, this is basically zero because it's it's such a small small number. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. So, question: If we wanted a target temperature at the middle of the fin, would we have to play with the initial temperature so that the target temperature would say 40 be in the middle? Yeah, yeah. So you can definitely um, you can definitely play with the parameters quite a bit. So you can play with the base temperature. You can play with the convection coefficient, right? So if we kind of reduce this convection coefficient, so let's say that uh, we reduce this, um, you know, to one tenth of what it was. So let's put to 0 0.05, and then for the radiation, let's reduce this also by a tenth. So let's say it's only going to be 0 0.03, and we can solve the system again. Hopefully, this doesn't take us long. We can look at the temperature distribution. You can see that now it takes a little bit longer for the temperature to drop off. Um, and then you can also play with this temperature. So let's say that we can make this 200, okay. Okay. And you can see even though the color distribution doesn't change all that much, the, the temperatures did change. So. Um, you can see right here, it's, it's still about 40 kind of around this kind of tealish area. Okay? So if you want to kind of move that over there, you can, you can reduce this even more. So you can reduce this to maybe 0 0.005 and reduce the radiation even more. Okay? You can solve it again. But yeah, if you, if you, uh, you, if you wanted to design this fin um, to kind of work under certain situations and, and reach some kind of target, you can definitely play with the numbers kind of exactly as you would with the structural simulations. You can kind of play with the boundary conditions, play with the geometry um, until you get kind of a, uh, a result that, that you're happy with for your design. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, any, uh, any final questions on, on this? All right, uh, so that's all I got planned for today. Um, so again, you know, these, um, these kind of short tutorials that's kind of outside our activities are they're gonna be a little bit shorter in nature. Um, so this one was about six and a half minutes short, uh, so not that short. Um, but, you know, hopefully this, this, you know, for those of you doing thermal simulations on, um, for your final projects, this at least gives you something to kind of start off. Um, just, just so you know where all the buttons are. And, you know, of course, um, you know, probably we'll, we'll have to, you know, talk just because you know this is probably the only day that we'll do thermal simulations, but hopefully this this gives you at least an idea of where all the buttons are. Okay, okay so if, if there's no more questions, then that's all I got planned for today. So um, so um, thanks for tuning in today. Um, I'll see everyone on Thursday. So don't forget to turn in your your progress reports. Okay. So have a great day, everyone. Um, stay safe and stay healthy, and I'll see you on Thursday. All right, so I'll stay. I'll stay on. I'll stay on the. Uh, I'll stay on the Zoom room for um, you know at least until the lecture ends, in case there are any more questions on this. Yeah, sure, Johnny, what's up? Do you want to talk here or do you want to talk um, in office hours? So um, after this, I'm going to basically open up office hours. Um, with I can talk here. I mean, okay. Yeah, what's up? So for my project of like the dynamic that I have to do, like the dynamic features, mm -hmm. I had a 